What we're living through is something that is being perpetrated and has been very carefully planned by an evil, evil cabal. The ones who really plan mm -hmm. are behind the curtain. They don't want anyone to know who they are. Someone anonymously actually sent me an article from the American Journal of Psychiatry. And what it described, I immediately said, this is Nazi medicine. And the insurance companies just happen to be his biggest campaign contributors. Mm -hmm. That's bribery. <laughs> that sounds like bribery. That's real bribery. A lot of the bribery, you know, is quietly, you know, you give grants, you do this, you do that. And the bribery comes bo from both government and the pharmaceutical companies. We ostensibly have democracies, so they're supposed to ask us. But all these things are being done without asking us. Mm -hmm. That's really how it's happened, but it's happened in stages, very slow stages. Thanks for tuning in today. Today, my guest is Vera Sharav, and I'm here with you today. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. <clears throat> uh, I looked you up on Wikipedia but I'm, I'm not going to say what they said. I want you to tell my audience who you are, what you're up to. I don't care what's written down in the press, in the media. Yeah, I don't read Wikipedia either. <laughs> it's kind of a hit job for some of us. <laughs> for anyway. some of us, yeah. For some of us, so yeah. I don't. But I've been a lifelong, really, uh, human rights advocate. Uh, in part... In part, the reason is that I'm a child survivor of the Holocaust. So I'm very attuned, very uh, aware of um, prejudice and the abuse of some people who are considered lower, less mm -hmm. valuable. Mm -hmm. And especially... In the area of medicine, public health, what I've learned really through the years is that there is still a pervasive culture of eugenics. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody talks about eugenics anymore. That's a term that's not used uh, after the Nazis, really. But that doesn't mean that that culture went away. It didn't. There are classes of people, some ethnic and some, you know, economic, it doesn't matter really. Mm -hmm. But when, when those who govern regard some people as lower, as less valuable, they disregard their humanity, their human rights. They don't consider them equal, so they think that they are entitled to use them for the greater good. The greater good. There is no greater good. Right. What does the greater good mean? Exactly. The greater good essentially means that some people's rights uh, are simply dispensed for other people's good. Well, who is playing God? Mm -hmm. Who's deciding which people may rule over others by simply disregarding them as equals? Now, how, is, how did you get started on this train of thought? Because this is a very deep and philosophical train of thought. What brought you here? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, I got to know, uh, once I was known a little bit, people would send me information. Mm. And I started to realize I was horrified. The first time really was when someone anonymously actually sent me an article from the American Journal of Psychiatry. And what it described, I immediately said, this is Nazi medicine. Mm. It was an experiment conducted on 28 veterans who had had, were diagnosed with schizophrenia. But they were in remission. They were living in the community. Mm-hmm. But they were called into by the VA to the hospital, taken off whatever they were on, whatever regimens, and given L dopa, mm -hmm. and sent That's off. That's for Parkinson's usually. Yes. 
but it has a very nasty side effect, which is it induces psychosis. I see. And the purpose, that's what got me, was the purpose of the experiment was to document how long it would take for them to have psychotic relapse. I see. And I couldn't believe it. It was sort of an early scientific article that I read. And mm -hmm. I sent it to two doctors whom I knew. And I said, listen, am I reading this right? I, you know, I didn't mm -hmm. believe it. And they said yes. So that was the first time I filed a complaint with the Federal Office of Human Research Protection. This was a totally, wholly unethical experiment. It took them, <clears throat> the agency, four years to investigate, and they corroborated. Hmm. That, now, why, that, would, why would they be doing something like that? That's the point. Yeah. They regarded those veterans as beneath mm. contempt. So they are like rabbits. But you see, what happened then, even though they were found mm -hmm. to be absolutely was unethical, nothing happened to them. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. They used the veterans' hospital as a lab, as an available lab of human subjects. And a lot of different things are done there. So this would be a... An example of um, using an individual for the greater good again. Supposedly, but of course. Supposedly, yeah. Now, of course, one might ask, who's greater good anyway? Uh -huh. The greater good for getting, uh, getting money from the government. This was sponsored by the National Institute of Mental Health. You see, there's a lot of money in research with human beings. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they write up protocols, and it just gets accepted. How did it get accepted? Where was the Institutional Review Board? There's usually review boards. That this was done them. in 1987. Mm -hmm. Now, by then, we had such a thing as the Nuremberg Code. Uh -huh. So and, where and, was that? And, and uh, tell us what the Nuremberg Code says. The Nuremberg Code, I consider it to be the only value of the Nuremberg trials. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because this was at the end of the doctor's trial for the atrocities that the Nazi doctors committed. Mm -hmm. It was decided that in order to prevent such atrocities from ever happening again, we have to have universal ethical standards. Right. And those standards, there are 10 of them. And the first, the foremost, is voluntary informed consent. Mm -hmm. Voluntary, not coerced, not bribed, not anything like that right. for any human experiment. And clearly, those veterans weren't given informed consent, nor were they told what the experiment was about, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nor the fact that they could refuse. You see, this is very important. Every human being has the right to refuse to become a subject of any kind of medical experiment, whether potentially harmful or not. Right. We have inalienable rights, and this made it universal. What's interesting about the Nuremberg Code is that whenever it was cited in American law, mm -hmm. it was accepted. Mm -hmm. Judges accepted it and cited it and that sort of thing. One case actually involved Pfizer. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they lost. So it really... The, the problem with the Nuremberg Code isn't a problem with the code, but with the fact that lawyers are too lazy to use it properly, mm. to invoke it. Mm. I see. You see, and if they do, uh, you know, some things will not be done. One of the things I'm trying to do is actually to have people understand that they they have rights under the Nuremberg Code, and we've put a little booklet together, mm -hmm. which gives them that. 
they need to show that when somebody wants to force you to take an, an experimental injection, you can put this under their... They have certain things that they have to do. Part of it is total disclosure of mm -hmm. all possible and foreseeable harm. Right, right. They have to be told exactly what the ingredients are, what the purpose of the experiment is. Mm -hmm. You can't just use people as though they're widgets. Right. And that's unfortunately what many in the medical field feel that they can do. Now, this is particularly true in psychiatry, uh, which is something that I tackled. And I really found that the attitude in psychiatry is the attitude today with COVID. Mm. That you don't have any rights. Only now it's everyone. It's not only patients who are being dictated to, but everyone. See, they keep expanding their um, their data set. That's the way they would regard it. You know, they don't regard the humans in experiments as people. So when you talk about psychiatrists, then are you, you're talking about psychiatric drugs, yes? A lot of psychiatric drugs, but there were also mind control. I mean, there's a lot of very, very dark experiments that have been done under psychiatry. Mm -hmm. Let's psychiatry and also psychologists. Well, uh, Abu Ghraib, those torture things at Guantanamo Bay. That's all done under psychologists, True. And psychiatrists. Yeah, See? yeah. It, it it keeps metastasizing if you don't stop it. Mm -hmm. They've done things with now. Children. Why why do people why do people um put up with these things? What do you think we do in our lives that uh, makes us vulnerable to those kinds of experiments and those kind of manipulations? Well, people, people are being educated to comply without using their own judgment. And how are they, how is that done? This is a, a whole educational system. It's right from kindergarten. You keep on, you're supposed to listen and obey the mm -hmm. teacher, the authority, the expert. Mm -hmm. How many times did we hear during COVID these last three and a half years, follow the science as if there is the science? Mm -hmm. No such thing. So under that kind of a spell, and by not explaining to people, by not leveling with them what the injections are, what the masks do and don't do. Mm -hmm. You see, people comply. Mm -hmm. And it seeped into such a degree that we really have, you know, millions of people complying. They don't realize it's self-harm. If they don't comply, they won't be harmed. Yeah, so, but people are afraid to speak yes. out for that's, some reason. Well, that's part of it. That's where propaganda fits in. And that's very much the way the Nazis operated, too, which is to put the fear, fear of an enemy. Right. And this time the enemy is unseen. It's invisible. That makes it even more powerful because this way people really masked, distrusting anybody without a mask. Mm -hmm. You demonize people. Yeah. And so then, so this was... Uh Medically, government-enforced tyranny. It couldn't have been done without the total complicity of the medical establishment. Right, and the complicity of the population. Well, yes. But, but why would they comply, right? What, what do, where, where, where do we start to go wrong in, and not just as children, not just as children in the education, but in people in their workplaces, in in just in our lives. What are we doing just in our everyday lives that makes us more resilient or makes us more vulnerable to that kind of suggestion? Well, what I have observed mm -hmm. is that the ones least complicit, mm -hmm. least willing to give up their own judgment. Yeah are the blue-collar working class. Now, why would that be, do you think? And I think part of it is because, number one, they have a healthy distrust of government. Just just because government says so doesn't mean they 
you know, will go along. Secondly, they haven't been indoctrinated for as many years as those with the PhDs and the MDs and all of that. So the people, the less time that so the they people spend, that are in, indoctrinated are more uh, more in bed with the system, right? So they're they're um, getting uh, positive um, kickbacks yep. from the system, whereas the working class maybe aren't. They're getting rewarded, yeah, with grants, right? With degrees, with all sorts of accolades. With yeah, there's both a financial and professional investment. Um, the other thing is that, you know, medical education is very much an up-down, very much authoritarian. You do not question. Right. You're yeah. supposed to memorize. The other thing is that professionals, and, and now we've seen it particularly affecting doctors, who were given protocols that they must follow. These are dictated by government with the seal of the medical establishment. Thou shalt not deviate. And so that's why you had a whole lot of preventable deaths from COVID. They were put on ventilators rather than get hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin or all the, a whole combination of things. I was in, I was in, I was a, a visitor to the court system yesterday. One of our doctors has been, her, her license was taken away yeah. two years ago, and she was in the appeal court. And uh, her her lawyer was putting up good arguments for yeah. um, the fact that she had been offering her patients um, mm. ivermectin and, yeah. and vitamins and, and such, right. and that no one had complained. It was only an employer that uh, told the college that this was going on when they asked for all of her files with the names. They didn't want the files without the names because they want all our information. And so now she's in court and the college came back saying, you know, this really isn't uh, a case. It's not ready for the courts yet. She should be in disciplinary <laughs> hearings. So they defer, they were deferring it was very the judgment and going the sideways, right? Say, well, we although we're in the court of appeal, really where we should be is in the is in the disciplinary hearing within the college, and so really all these arguments that these people they're they're not even. Well, I will tell you that there was just now a court decision that said hydroxychloroquine was the right thing to do. It did save lives, and right. I have. You know, one one of my best friends, a doctor in Maine. Yeah. As a matter of fact, she just went through that whole thing with the board. Oh. Where again, despite mm. the fact that the witnesses and all the evidence is what it is, and for the same reason, she uh, prescribed, you know, what she knew was yeah. the right thing, and no complaints ever from any patient. Right. 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 But what was interesting after six sessions, I mean, it, it was. It really was like Six being sessions. crucified. It was terrible, you know, mm -hmm. just to, for her to have to listen to go through all this. And in the end, yeah, they did the same thing, which is all kinds of disciplinary things. Even though she never did anything wrong, the only thing they could uh, accuse her of is she didn't have proper notes during this emergency. And right. all supposed to, you know, I mean, it, they mm -hmm. had nothing on mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. But they did, they throw their weight around that way, thinking thinking that they are immune because government, they're government protected. Right. Well, she's suing each one of them on the board. Mm -hmm. We'll see what, how that fans out, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. now that a decision in New York has been that, yes, hydroxychloroquine right. was the right medicine. Right. It wasn't uh, dangerous for people. You know, there is... I think, at least in the judiciary in the United States, mm -hmm. there is a slow shift. Oh, good. And part of it is, look, judges are people. Yeah. And they do listen to... They're listening. They're yeah. listening. Mm -hmm. And that's important because it's when you stop listening that you remain in your box, you know, in your yeah. preordained greater good box. Yeah, I've been talking a lot and thinking about listening a lot and that if you listen then your preconceived ideas can be changed. Then you, yes, because you're using your mind. Yeah. So that's uh, that's very important. And 
what I notice, and, and this is confirmed by a lot of people, those who've had rifts, you know, within the family and friends, those who take the shot and those who don't. Yeah. That if you want to talk to those who are commit, who they don't want to talk. Yeah, right. They don't want to talk. Why not? Why not? Why Why don't you want to argue? I mean, you normally argue about all kinds of things. Why not this? Right. That's, yeah. Why it's very, not? This is their defense. I don't want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then it's over. And then there's no I, ne- there's no negotiation. There's no negotiation. But what does it really mean? I think psychologically, it means they are afraid because mm-hmm. they really don't know. They really don't have very good convincing arguments. So you're not afraid. Why aren't you afraid? You know what? One of the things that really, again, that I've learned, and I actually. I guess I felt it even as a child. And that is that we as individuals are unpredictable. Mm. That's one of the things that's the beauty of the human species. But it's the thing that those who want to rule us, who want to dictate to us, that is their biggest problem. Mm. They can control crowds. They can control masses. They can't predict the individual who's not going to comply. Right. And I guess some of us simply are stubborn in our belief that we know best what's best for us. It's a very human, you know, it's a responsibility. Right, it's a responsibility. When you defer to others, you're abdicating your responsibility as a human being and certainly as a parent. Right, so in order to... uh in order to stand up to a tyranny or to the collective, yeah. you have to take responsibility. Absolutely. And so how do you take responsibility? By evaluating yourself based on your experience, your intuition, your feeling, your gut feeling. Gut feelings are very important. They're, they are not less than the science. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, world experience. And the intuition and the gut feeling... What is that in um, more uh, literate uh, you see, we can, circles? We can make mistakes, obviously. Everybody does. I mean, if yeah. you live long enough, you make mistakes. Right. But we're supposed to learn from them. Mm-hmm. You don't learn from other people's mistakes. Right. And the thing is that the authorities that you're told to follow, when they make mistakes, not just mistakes, but really murderous mistakes, they're never held accountable. Right. When you make mistakes, you're accountable. You know, you suffer the consequences. So you learn from it. Right. And so if, as an individual, in order to make mistakes, you have to try something. Yeah. You have to take action. That's right. And how do you decide what action to take? Your intuition. Again, there is no one formula. Right. People need to stop thinking that there is one answer mm-hmm. to very complicated issues. No, there isn't. We have to, it's a multi-pronged way of, each person may have something else to present. Right. Some strength, some thing that others don't. That's why you need really, you know, an army, essentially. Different people are good at different things. Mm-hmm. And how do you decide what you're good at? Because that's what people struggle with, I know too. They is do. Ha- ha- well, like, I don't know what I'm good at. I don't think anybody has a single answer. But the first thing to do is when you don't like something or that doesn't sound right to right. you, just something say no. Something bugs you. Just say no. Remember Nancy yeah. Reagan? That was her one <laughs> right, contribution. Right, just right. say no. Yeah. That, that holds. That really does hold. Yeah. So if something bothers you, pay yeah. attention. Right? Yeah. Yeah, pay attention. Follow that thread. Follow that inner th- voice that's telling you no. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that a lot of people, they're thinking about how they're going to appear, right? So they're wondering how they're going to, wh- when they show up to work, what other people are going to think. Very. There's a lot of, and like, who knows what that comes from? We're so connected now. Maybe that's... Well, Partly we're connected, but we're isolated. Mm. That's really, I mean, how connected are two people sitting 
in the park or even in a right. restaurant. Each one is in their cell with somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's you know, that's a falsehood. We thought that that's what it was. Or people walking across the street, someone could be falling. They don't notice anything. No. Nothing around them. Yeah. They're glued to that. No, this was a mesmerizing uh, gadget. Yes. Mm-hmm. And... Um... What is, what is the draw, you know? What is it that's on our phones and in our computers that is taking us in the right direction or the wrong direction? By now, I think it all is in the wrong direction. You do, eh? And I think we're going to have to throw away that phone. Yeah. Because it is a surveillance mechanism. That's its primary function, really. Right. We had the illusion that this was going to connect us all and, and we could... Uh, access all kinds of information that we couldn't otherwise. Sure, those are conveniences, but how much are you willing to give up for convenience? Right. So, yeah. in order to, because everybody has these things, yeah. what what can we do in order to navigate this system that we're in right now without just throwing it all away? And I can understand that throwing it all the way would would change things, but where we are right now is right here with these things we really are right here now yeah. and it's and it's getting actually you know worse and worse we're on a precipice the next thing after since they seem to realize that the next booster is not going to work too well not you know millions aren't going to throng so the financial issues that's the next one they want to essentially take away our assets and with a digital id digital id yes that's that's the next. And once we point. have a digital ID, then if we go to the hospital or if we go to get a new job. They know everything about you and they can stop you. China is the example for that. Right. Well, what's happening Those are in ghettos. China. It's mm -hmm. Digital IDs are ghettos. That's the first part. That's the way the Nazis operated. The first part was to put the Jews in ghettos. Mm -hmm. It's only later the concentration camps and the death camps. I mean, it, it's in gradation. And so in China, and in China, how, how are these ghettos being uh, set up? Why are they being set up? Well, uh, they're, you know, one of the things, unfortunately, you know, with China and altogether Far East, those populations have been used to not have democracy. They never had democracy. Mm -hmm. They're used to having an emperor, you know, and to obey orders. And right. that's, that's, this is where it leads to. Mm -hmm. So they can implement, you know, a, a social, uh, what do they call it? The, the, social credit system? The social credit system, which the digital ID facilitates because we don't like the book you're reading. We don't like the, the, the coffee you bought, whatever. Yeah. We can cut off your source of money. Or you've been too close with with someone who right. has a lower social credit score, right. so now your social credit score is lower. Yeah. And that divides people. Yes. It, it's Yes. So, in other words, the surveillance gets to the absolute core. It's, it's so much more insidious. I know people who lived under the Soviet. Mm-hmm. Well, at that time, the surveillance of, yes, things were wired in, in the apartments and things so that people knew that if you want to speak, you go to the forest, you go to the hills. Right. And that's what they did. That's how they did it. And mm -hmm. as far as information, it was Zamistat, which was um, the mimeographed sheets. Mm -hmm. You know, people would type out whatever they wanted and that the government wouldn't allow. And the joke was that husband comes home and he sees his wife typing away, typing away. What are you typing? War and peace. Why do you have to type war and peace? It's a book. She said, unless it's in Zamistad, your son won't believe it. That's So they, they got around it in that way. And those Zamistad things eventually worked. Mm. So it was what it was, was written rebellion. down? <clears throat> it was what was written down? Yeah. Now, you know, I mean, mm. I think... One of the things that we have been seeing, witnessing, mm -hmm. is that there, you know, as they censor some uh, platforms, you know, they censor us, other platforms keep cropping up. True, yeah. And that's really, there are more 
information sources today than there were three years yes, ago. Yes, aren't there? It's, Amazing. Mm-hmm. It is. So th- this is another reason that I really don't have a lot of uh, patience with people who simply are being willfully ignorant right. by not extra clicks. You you can get information. Right, right. Well, you know, we were traveling, and uh, my husband's mother and sister were with us, and um, she was listening to what was going on on the tour. We we're on our book tour, and but she's she's in Canada, and she wonders where should I get my where should I get my information from because I've been listening and watching the CBC. Hmm. Uh, I don't know any way else to get information, and we thought, yeah, you know that's true. There's a there's a a segment of the population who doesn't yet know. Yeah about this alternative right. communication. And so then they're at risk for indoctrination. Exactly, and, and it's it's 24-7. Whenever there's a big scare, the, the propaganda is constant, 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 yeah. reinforcing. Yeah. And each one is reinforcing the other, reading from the same script. I mean, that's been shown too. Um, mm-hmm. It behooves intelligent people to look elsewhere. Yeah. Now, of course, it you know it used to be, for example, in New York, we used to have something like five newspapers, mm-hmm. morning, afternoon, and evening. Mm-hmm. All that's gone. Yeah. Only mm-hmm. I think five networks on all of the United States, you know, news sources. Right. But that's the mainstream media. Yeah. Now, of course, what happens with a lot of alternative is you have to sift through. Again, you have to evaluate which one sounds real, Mm -hmm. provable, and which one is also, you know. Turning out uh, a narrative that you probably shouldn't listen to. Yeah, it's very tricky. But that's why we need maybe uh, a community, a community of people together who can inform one another. You know, it's very, it's, that's one model that can work in small communities. Yeah. But those of us, like in New York City, that's not quite possible. I mean, even, let's say, my own building, I live in a building with 30 stories. I don't have anybody in the, you know? Mm-hmm. People are very, very separate. That's... Not good, but that's how it is. That's the reality. Right, right. And um, so a, another model needs to be devised for, yeah, urban people. You can't have, you know, no matter how how many ways you look at it, one model will not work for everybody. It just right. won't. Well, there's people on farms, too, who are quite isolated. That's right. And the other thing is, there's another aspect to this which is that centralized governments, centralized agencies, are always bad for the common man. Why is that? Because they are, they are making decisions not based on reality, on what's really in front of them, but on some other agenda. So, for example, Stalin, he used to have a 20-year plan, a 10-year yeah. Every one of those, and that had to do with agriculture mm-hmm. and you know, and, and industry. Every one of those was a abysmal failure. And why was that? Because they didn't really know what people wanted. Right. So there is a disconnect they were, between. I mean, the, the government joke and the was they, they they had a lot of jokes. These mm-hmm. Russians know how to laugh at themselves too <laughs> and uh one joke was well you're going to have a, a helicopter an airplane and you'll be and he said what do i need an airplane for well you hear that in vladivostok they're selling shoes you're going to be the first one online with your <laughs> with your plane i mean the idea you need a plane to get a pair of shoes yeah right because it's all planned, and planned ahead is no good. And we saw that. That's exactly what happened that was really the initial wrong step with COVID. The idea that somebody in Washington or the WHO mm-hmm. was going to, and they did, they dictated 
protocols that doctors in, who had patients in front of them had to follow. Mm -hmm. That's a disaster. Mm -hmm. That's exactly a disaster. And it right. was a disaster. Right. And so the, then there's a, a, there's a disconnect then between what is uh, a lofty idea and the implementable on the ground. And so what do we do to bring uh, subsidiarity back in where there's where you're connected to each and every one of the steps up and that the power is it with the individual and not with the government. Well, you know, this is why you have the Hippocratic Oath. This, you know, the Greek <laughs> original, of course, now doctors don't even swear that either. No, really? No. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but the foremost principle there is first do no harm. Right, right. And that is a... An oath, that, which is a personal oath of the doctor to the patient. Right. Really. And it's to the individual patient. Right. Doctors don't have an oath for the greater good, no. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because each each individual is what makes up the greater good. I mean, I, you know, if you are have a livable society for each individual you've got a good society for everybody that's the that's the real greater good where did you learn that that's, that's I such learned a good it. principle I, uh, i've been observing for a long time you yeah. know i'm a little bit older than yeah. you yeah yeah <laughs> so no this is truly you don't need all kinds of i don't know what people expect that somebody will put you know solutions into your head just like that. No, it takes time. It takes observation. We need to be observant about the people around us, about problems around us, and and then figure out this worked then. Maybe it'll work now. This didn't work then. Then don't bother with it now. You know, that sort of thing. We need always to weigh things. Right. Which means our brains have to be free to think. Mm -hmm. When you are under a spell under orders, you are dissuaded from thinking yourself. You know, in, in the past, people have, because they've lived through tyranny and experienced it, say when they were young, and then when they grow older, they take their experience with them and it informs who they are. But the people now, especially in Canada, we've had a, we have had a very good go of it for a very long time, through my lifetime for sure. I was born in the early 60s, so everything has been uh, easy for us and smooth mm -hmm. for us. And now we're to a point where uh, we seem to have given up our mm, responsibility for each and everything that we're doing. And uh, how do we bring back that urgency to people? Well, it, it seems to me as though one of the things that was on an agenda, and it was a murderous agenda, it was right in the very beginning, in 2020, when essentially the elderly were medically murdered. Now, part of it was an economic issue. Insurance companies got rid of, you know, having to pay people out for their lifetime. Uh, and part of it was also, you know, think about children and grandparents Children have a very special relationship with grandparents. It's very different than with parents. Mm -hmm. They love to hear grandparents' stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how they gain some grandparents' wisdom. Yeah. They didn't want that. They Part of the isolation, mm -hmm. particularly of the elderly, and telling children, you, if you go near grandpa, you, you could kill him. I mean, what kind of yeah? Well, that was so Why strange, did they yeah. do that? Mm -hmm. But they did. Yeah, it was very strange. This was, I believe, with full malice of forethought. This mm. is not by chance. They were they under the rubric of protecting the elderly. They were killing them. Well, they were isolating them first off. First right? isolating and then killing. I understand. Again, I just got an email yesterday that uh, somebody is taking, trying to take Andrew Cuomo to court oh, precisely yeah? for that. And mm. what's interesting about that particular case 
I had spoken out about it right away, I, I realized, because before Andrew Cuomo gave the order that the elderly were all to be sent to nursing homes, he they predict- were sending people to nursing yes. homes? Yes, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought it was just the people in the nursing homes no, had to stay there. No, they didn't want them in hospitals. Oh, I too see. Too right precious. Right. You know, the beds are oh, shortage okay. and all that. Oh, yeah. Which was a lie. Mm. No, that's true because one of my nephews is a, a doctor, a resident, and he said that their hospitals were busy. There were busy. three hospitals in New York City that were bombarded yeah. because they were everybody was sent there. But he issued an order to... For hospitals not to treat the elderly, send them to nursing homes. Okay. Before he issued the order, he stated, this virus in nursing homes will be like fire through dry grass. Right. When I heard that, that's all I needed to know. Mm. And I spoke up about it. Early on, and you have no idea how many people tried to shush me. No, Vera, you don't mean he meant. They didn't know. I said, excuse me, these are his words. Before he issued the order, he made sure to give immunity to hospitals and to nursing homes. And the insurance companies just happened to be his biggest campaign contributors. What do you mean immunity to the nursing homes? What do you mean immunity? Immunity from liability. From liability. For murder. Mm. Yeah, like all, all of these people were deemed to die from COVID. You're right. They, and, and Whether those, they had heart it, disease or not. And the institutions got money, extra money. We're talking thousands and thousands of dollars for every COVID death. Ah. That's how you get the numbers up in order to be able to keep frightening people about the huge death rate right. from COVID. Well, you, as you know, Dr. Rancourt, Dennis Rancourt, a Canadian, has now done an absolutely spectacular uh, research of, you know, really globally. There was, there were no extra deaths in 2020 hmm. compared to 2019, 2018, there were and there are extra deaths, 2021, 22. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the whole thing was a lie. And we don't, we don't, we don't know what the uh, outcome is. It takes a while to figure out what the outcome is yeah. of all the vaccines. That is piling up, the deaths and maiming and, and cancer and myocarditis. I mean, there... Look, this is genetic tinkering that's never been done before. And when it Mm -hmm. was done on animals, they died. Now, people don't want to hear that Mm -hmm. because doctors told them, no, it's fine, it's fine. I tell people, ask your doctor, what's in the vaccine? What's in them? He doesn't know. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know. But not to ask. Right. So you've got... Doctors regimented like an army. I, I, sir, you know, and they follow the protocol. Well, if enough people asked them what was in it, they would ask what was in it, right? They should be asking yeah. what's in it. They should demand. Yeah. And the fact is, it's a blank piece of paper that's the insert. Now, a- any rational person, you don't have to be a genius to say, well, wait a minute. Before you, <laughs> before you inject me, I want to know what's in it. I mean, that's such a basic question. It's under military secret. Why military? Why was the military involved in rolling out the COVID injections? That's another important question. Yeah, well, they, they like to, uh, I imagine that they were thinking that it was so widespread that they needed help. And so then they called in the military. The military was never involved in contracting therapeutic anything. Mm-hmm. They're involved in, you know, murderous operations, killing. I mean, this is how to wipe out the enemy. So why would you conflate that? It's a different culture entirely. And, and yet the fact that doctors accepted it is really... Doctors should have certainly stood up and said, wait a minute, we're not following this. Now, there are. What's different really Mm. now compared to the Nazis was there are thousands of doctors and scientists who have really risked 
their careers and their livelihood and, of course, their reputations. They're really uh, a whole vindictive uh, way is being dealt with them. I mean, it's really brutal. Some have been really brutalized because they're asking the right questions and because they recognize that they don't want to participate in something that is harming millions of people. Right. And so really where we are now, we we don't know the outcome, but we are asking questions. There Mm -hmm. are people asking questions. And now we have the media to ask those questions with as well. Well, you know, the the mainstream media, you forget it because they're totally, again, they're bored. I mean, this is bribery. This bribery, though, has has occurred over quite a few decades. This is not a brand What kind of bribery do you think has happened? Bribery, we're talking about, well, for example, uh, Biden actually gave a billion dollars to media to only report positive things about the vaccines. Yeah, and that's a billion on top of the normal kind of you know this was just a thrown away you know right in in twenty twenty one, I mean that's yeah that's bribery. Mm-hmm. That's bribery. <laughs> that's, that sounds like bribery. That's real bribery. I mean, you know that anybody can recognize, but a lot of the bribery is be you know is quietly you know you give grants you do this you do that, and the bribery comes bo- from both government and the pharmaceutical companies. You know, in Pinocchio, mm-hmm. when Pinocchio, uh, he meets, he goes to Pleasure Island with all the delinquents, and there he meets the devil. And they're all uh, at an amusement park. They're all at an amusement park having loads of fun, not going to school, which was their responsibility, because their responsibility was to be schoolboys, mm-hmm. but now they're at the amusement park, and there they find uh, the circus master. Uh, so they're, they're, uh, there's top-down dictation that takes over once they have given away their responsibilities. Yeah. So if people in our society are going to stand up to this, and there are some people, like the doctors that like you said, yeah. are standing up, but but we have to do each of us do our part, right? And so for each of us to do our part. Yes, that's right. If each of us did our part, it's over. It's over. It's over. We are the many. I mean, it's not even, a, you know, I mean, at most, let's say, there are a thousand. And at the top, they're not a thousand. They might be 11 families. But... Mm. Think about it. We're seven and a half billion people. If we just say no, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's their fear. Their fear is that we are gaining, but it's slow. Mm-hmm. It's slow. But the more we talk about this, the faster and, it will uh, be. So that's why they're sort of accelerating the pace, because their goal is 2030 to the new world order, you know. Yeah. Who asked? Did you vote for a new world order? Yeah, no. I, don't I didn't see that asked. on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember being asked. And yet, you know, we ostensibly have democracies, so they're supposed to ask us. But all these things are being done without asking us. Mm-hmm. That's really how it's happened. But it's happened in stages, very slow stages. And so in order to fight against it day to day, we have to make some changes. Yeah. I mean, really, it's, um, yeah, the workplace, the, the elevators, you know, if you have to wear masks. I mean, all those things, one has to say no. Yeah, right. Yeah. Just say no. Just say, say no to something that you feel is manageable and see how it goes. Yeah. Right? Start, right. start somewhere. Mm-hmm. Start somewhere that's not too scary. Yeah. Do it there and then. And, and, and see what, I, rather than doing nothing. Yeah, and people who have done it really feel they get gain strength. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, That's one good, of good the things, for your immune system, probably. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things early on, when I first woke up mm-hmm. to the fact that 
the whole COVID thing was a lie, it was very early because we were, you know, under lockdown and all that. And, um, and we, I had calls from others, relatives. Oh my God, New York City, Central Park, they're, they're putting out cots and stuff like that. I said, what are you talking about? At the same time, there were a few women, and I don't know where they disappeared or what, but they went with the iPhone and took videos of empty hospitals. Mm. When I saw that, I said, that's it. I know this is, and that's exactly, mm -hmm. it was a lie. But the doctors and nurses in those three hospitals where they sent everyone, I mean, they Thought were sure, busy. you know, they yeah. were deluged. Right, right. But it was a put-up job. This was a planned thing. And, of course, since then we know that it was created in a lab and released from the lab. It had nothing to do with nature. And at first, remember, every scientist who dared mention maybe this was done in the Wuhan lab or another lab, really, there were hundreds of them in Ukraine, in the United States, they're all over, where they, under the guise of, quote, gain-of-function, Research. What is gain of function? It's biological warfare research. That's what it is. And so, where did they think that this came from? Because I don't know. It it was produced in labs by scientists. Where? It doesn't matter really where. There's North Carolina. There's Wuhan. There are a lot of places. They were they worked in unison. And again, remember the U.S. government was paying for a lot of this, including the what they were doing in China was paid for by Fauci. Right. Well, biological warfare Institute. is a thing. I mean, for this sure. is this was, and this has been going on for quite a few years. And SARS most of was the time a, was, it was a illegal. new one, right? SARS was a an yeah. early manifestation. Yeah. yeah. So things like that really just don't happen, and and real scientists realize that. That's not that's not how infections work. That's not how viruses work. If they're so lethal, it can't spread because the person dies. Right, right, right. So everything mm -hmm. about if you just think a little, and you don't have to be a scientist. I'm certainly not a scientist, but I listen to scientists, mm -hmm. and then I evaluate which one sounds, you know, what's plausible to the degree that I understand it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I'm always right, but on this sort of thing, it's very, you know, because. The, quote, virus was used to scare people into obedience so that now they don't question, is it necessary? Until, the, I think the first break, really, the real break, came when the FDA gave permission to inject the babies, the six-month-old to three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. That's when the mamas... Right. The maternal instinct finally kicked in. They didn't bring the babies. That mm -hmm. was that was their first huge, huge mistake, overreaching. And thank goodness, mm -hmm. most you know most mothers did not bring their babies. Some did, and they will live to regret it. Now, um, I have I have read that there's some methods to. Um, Reverse some of the effects of they're the. They're working on it, but it's not they're easy. On it. Is that yes? There are scientists working on it. Of course, that's the point. The scientists who are the rebels mm -hmm. who said no and and wouldn't go along. Yes, first they devised you know the various combination of things that you can take, which includes a lot of, a lot of repurposed drugs. In other words, right. these are off patent, which is why they didn't allow you to use it. Nobody could make a fortune right, out of it. Right, right. But in addition now, now that they have more or less some of the formulas to deal with it, they're trying to see how can you wash out the body. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Because th there again was a huge lie. We were told the injection just stays in your arm. <laughs> now, if you're a thinking person, <laughs> no injection help, just it? stays in your arm. That wouldn't uh, help anyway. What would you need it for? <laughs> It goes all over the bloodstream, you know, yeah. and no barriers. So everything was done with such, really, it's evil. This, what we're living through, 
is something that is being perpetrated and has been very carefully planned by an evil, evil cabal. And why do you think that evil, evilness has got a grip? How did that come about? I don't think that ever was a time in human history when there weren't some evil people because True. we have choice. No, I don't, I don't either. But why does it have a, a grip on us a, a, of this magnitude now? Well, think about it. It, it, it. There's been an escalation. World War One, World War Two, included more, and now it's global. They've And they've done local... Wars all over, you know, under the Obama administration, we had eight wars. Unwinnable. They even said unwinnable wars. Well, if it's unwinnable, what for? Wars are very, very profitable. Let's Mm -hmm. really understand. There are people who made fortunes each war, and that's accumulated. And it's come to the point where now they want everything. They want all of our assets. They want to destroy the agriculture so that there'll be food shortage. Yeah. This is all, this isn't nature. Nature is not. Now, when you talk about they, who do you mean when you talk about they? That's the, okay, one of the, (laughs) one of the um, aspects of the they is that it's not just the Klaus Schwabs and the Fauci's. All of them are the visible, mm-hmm. you know, menacing. The ones who really plan mm-hmm. are behind a curtain. They don't want anyone to know who they are. And that's been for, it's dynasties. There are dynasties that have continued since a long time. Very long time. So there were dynasties during the world wars. Yeah, there, there were, and some of you know some of the uh, evidence for this has come out. I mean, for example, World War Two documents. Mm-hmm. You know, after eighty years, they've released quite a bit, and you suddenly realize, hey, some of them are still now. That's right. And who were some of those people? The Rockefeller, mm-hmm. Rothschilds, mm-hmm. and businesses. And sure, and some of them, multinational corporations, the global. Co- that's that's who has their eye on taking the whole thing. They want to eliminate nationalities, borders, mm. all municipalities for sure. They want to have a, and they tell you it's it's all written, it's all laid out. They want one world government. One World Health Organization that tells everybody in the universe what they may do, and they did it during COVID. Yeah, that was a trial. This is the deadly thing, what we talked about before, about centralization. That's exactly what they want, so that there is no, nobody disagrees with anything. They just wait for their orders and do it, or else. So as the little guy then, as the local little guy who's watching this podcast and wondering what he can do, well, you know, that's just it. A lot of locals can make a big difference. And I think that a good deal of that is happening in the United States. In what way? A lot of the areas where, you know, where the farmers are, the blue-collar people, as I mentioned before, the blue-collar people are sort of... uh they don't trust and they don't just obey just like that. The truckers. Mm. And what kind of responsibility can we take to bring Well, one of the things I think that's us. a problem is that how we can reach them and work together. Uh-huh. Because I think that they j- essentially don't trust us either. Mm-hmm. You see, we're, you know, <laughs> they. Uh, Sophisticates, you know, the educated. That's that's a problem. We need to, and which is one reason wherever I speak, I try to speak to people on their own, 
you know, where they can understand. I, I always have recoiled from using, you know, the, the proper vocabulary. Mm-hmm. And now the proper vocabulary, as you know, is really gender. I mean, what's gender, for God's sakes? It all made up stuff that in order to separate people, to make them... Yeah. And to destroy civilization in all its every aspect. I mean, it's, yeah. Well, it, we're it's, definitely seeing that with gender. It's total destruction, and this isn't happening by chance. Um, it's a, it's very complicated, and they don't certainly make it easy for us to see. But once you see, once you realize, and you, you see. Over and over that, oh, it's again that same sort of way of forcing people to change their way of living. Mm -hmm. And each step is for them to gain control. Right. So say say no to those. It's control, you know, and they're insatiable. I I mean, I called it the, it's the allure of power, Mm. greed, and control. That's the triumph. Right. And the thing about uh, the Judeo-Christian ethics is... They want to destroy that completely. Yeah, because that's about uh, being humble and realizing that we have no control over anything but ourselves. Yeah, and also believing in something other than technical, measurable, uh, you know, practical, technological, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. Spiritual spirituality is very much an enemy of the cabal. Right. And so that's one thing that individuals can do is they can... As is the family. And the family. The family unit. Right. The family unit, which they've tried to tear apart as well. I mean, Or has been tear, torn apart. That's where we are connected also to mammals. Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. it's even before humans. You know, this, this idea that you protect your young that you're a unit. Right, right. So, <laughs> going back to basics, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. really. Yeah. That's the that's kind of the answer. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. I know that it touches on many hot topics, you know, as far as what's a family. Today, what's a family? I mean, I don't know if you saw there was a video, what's a woman? Yes, and this I guy saw went that. all over, I couldn't... <laughs> That's that's really that's sad. Yes, that certainly is. That's very concerning. Yeah, that kind of confusion. Mm-hmm. They've sowed confusion. Into yeah, they're it. questioning the most basic of our yeah. presuppositions, mm-hmm. and those presuppositions are um, they're in the Bible. Yeah, and that's what the Bible's for: is to keep your ground, the you ground know, it, under your feet. It doesn't matter which you know which religion, which no. sect. That makes no difference that's at all. That's right. It's just that you understand that mm, man. There's a greater. There's yeah, there's a transcendent that. above you. Yeah, yeah. And that you aspire to right. Be good. That's the point. Aspire to good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and truth, and yeah. honesty. Truth is part of goodness. Well, you mentioned the Ten Commandments in one of your videos that we aren't adhering to the Ten Commandments. I remember. I'm sure that you said that in one of your videos that that we are not. Uh, thinking about what our basic ethics are are yeah. telling us to do when we're making our decisions and trying to control because uh, we have to look to those Ten Commandments to see if we're keeping things straight. Yeah, truth is, uh, you know, that's why truth is so important because in truth, you have really goodness. That's what it amounts to. But Truth also means recognizing, you know, enemy, recognizing those who are trying to suppress the truth. Yes, and saying, yeah, saying what you're afraid of yeah. is still truth. So mm. truth truth isn't always going to make things better in the short term. That's right. But it's better in the long term. Of course. Yeah. I mean, this is just it. I mean, uh, people who are spiritual recognize it's a long, you know, there's a long road. It's uh, Right. There are no quick fixes. No, and a quick fix m- means that uh, whatever is, um, I don't know, whatever is guiding you then is uh, cutting corners and 
uh, not taking in the whole situation and mm -hmm. not being thoughtful, right? Not being thorough. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to be that person who is as aware as you might have to be, as you do have to be. We also have to realize that different people will interpret a given situation differently. You know, like in Rashomon, the movie. Where, I don't know it. Oh, that's a Japanese movie. Mm -hmm. And it's about a rape. Mm -hmm. And the husband has been tethered and he has to watch his wife being raped. And then afterwards, the three tell the story what happened. Oh, Each yeah. one different. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out who's who's telling the real truth. Very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that depending on your situation and your position affects how you interpret what's going on. It's from your perspective, your knowledge. Each one, you could say, is the truth of that person. But what actually happens, you never know at the end. Right. So although there's although there's one truth, it it's um it's individual. Yeah. Right? That's right, exactly. Which it's individual, but through being because uh, it's not just individual, it has to really call to the collective as well, right? It has to serve mankind truth. Serves mankind. So it isn't it's it's not exactly an individual truth. It's a universal truth. But it's an individual, as an individual, you have to apprehend it mm -hmm. and see it, you know, and recognize it. Right. And see, it, it, it's, it's you know, you see it kind of like a piece of it from your perspective. Mm -hmm. And we all have, we bring to our perspective our experience. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. And through our experience, then, uh, like we patch a little bit of the universe mm -hmm. if we tell the truth and we tear it apart if we lie. You know, different people, and you know, there are people, for example, who don't, who haven't actually traveled, but they've traveled by reading, by, yeah. the, you know. Mm -hmm. So who's to say? Mm -hmm. You know, there are different ways of knowing the world. Yes, that's right. And people wonder who to look up to. Uh, who would you say people should look up to? Who Again, have you they have to find who their own you, hero. Who have you looked at? I have a heroine. Uh huh. Who's that? Eve. Ah. She disobeyed God to give us knowledge. And that bothers a lot of, you know, Orthodox and Christians and Jews. But I stick with it and, and I lived it. Disobey. Obeying God even for knowledge. And why do you say you lived it? Because when I was a child, six and a half, um, when I was, this is after I was in a camp and, and left Romania for final, um, there I, I left from Constanza, which is the harbor city in Romania, and there were three small boats that were, this is 1944, and I was supposed to go on the boat with the orphan children, but I refused, I absolutely refused, no matter what. I had an odyssey after I was separated from my mother. My father had died early in the camp. But I had a sort of a 10-month odyssey where I was a child without an adult taking care of. And we were to be, the final destination was Israel, was before the state was. Now, on the train to the harbor city, I befriended a family. I always, through these 10 months, what I learned to do was to discern people, to choose people adults mm -hmm. whom I could trust, who would, who I felt would help me, would take care of me, because I knew I couldn't take care of myself. So I befriended the family, and I wanted to go with the family. Mm -hmm. No matter what they did, everybody embarked. I was left alone on the, 
embankment there, sitting on my little valise and crying my heart up. But I wouldn't listen, no matter what. Hmm. Miraculously, they gave in to me. Now, today, a a six-and-a-half-year-old refusing to obey would be oppositional defiance disorder, you know, and get drugs. (laughs) So they let me go with the family. Well, that first night out at sea, a submarine torpedoed the boat with all the children. How many children? Lots. A few hundred. So that... You know, that decision of mine, that disobedience, saved my life. And what kind of disobedience was it, though? It was disobedience to authority. The what? To authority, right? It was the authority. They were telling you what to oh, do. Oh, no, so that, dis- the, actually, I mean, the authority was telling what to do. It was simply the, the directing traffic, you know, kind of yeah. thing. They had lists of the people, and they assigned one. And people didn't argue because it was sort of what difference does it make, which boat. But for me, it made a big difference. Yeah, what, you kept, what kept you on that shore, do you think? I just refused to obey the order. That's all. Mm-hmm. I trusted the family that I had befriended. I didn't trust the one giving the orders because I didn't know him. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I didn't want to be with all the children because I was little and bullying, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I, I And I was an only child, so I was used to adults. Mm-hmm. Right. And I trusted, you know, and I had to, all along those 10 months, I had to, tr- who would take, you know. Yeah. And it was the sort of the same thing with this. But the point is that even though the memory of that wasn't, you know, it wasn't constant in my consciousness at all, Mm -hmm. but I I guess I should say I I have been known to be stubborn. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And my husband had actually had the brunt of it. (laughs) But, uh, Mm -hmm. but, as they do. But that's what it really stems from. Because, in other words, knowing that by disobeying, you know, I was right. And at the time, I never said a word to anybody because I only learned about it in the morning. I, mm-hmm. I was seasick, so I was down. I didn't witness the mm-hmm. horror. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, to myself, I said I was right. Uh-huh, so that was the lesson for life. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, as you can imagine, that's not an easy thing, you know, everybody, oh, come on, you know, we got to get on the bun. You know, I just, I. Did you have faith at that point? No. No, huh? No, I, for the longest time, I lost faith. When my father died, mm-hmm. I didn't believe there could be a God, you know, that was. Right, yeah. So, no. Yeah. But that also made me realize I have to, you know, during this time that I have to take care of myself, where I couldn't really, I, I knew <laughs> the limitations of my ability, but I knew how to choose people. And, you know, when when the masking went on, I was just so horrified because I thought to myself, I I would never have been able to do what I did with all these masks. Mm -hmm. If you can't tell an expression, if you can't, you know, Mm. discern people, it's very important. And that's part of what they did to the little children. Mm -hmm. I think some children didn't learn how to pronounce words because they didn't see how the lips I mean that's sadism Mm -hmm. yes I agree with that and I still see I still see people in masks too and sometimes I see families in masks and it's fear uh, it's all fear driven now I I know and they think they're doing you know they're protect they just don't want to think I mean it's look I mean there's only so much we can do, but we can salvage many more people. I yes, think. Yes, I yeah. agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.